sometimes, uh, not always, but sometimes um, there just needs to be a time of, of uh, teaching. Uh, so, you know, there's various aspects, if you will, of preaching, but one of the aspects of preaching is teaching. And so this is, uh, I just, uh, it's more of a teaching type message. I hope we're convicted, though. I hope the message speaks to our hope, heart. I hope we're challenged in this, but <clears throat> there have been a number of of um, events that have brought brought this kind of thing about. <clears throat> it really it began to. I, I, well, that's not true. Um, it began a long time ago. You know, pe people have. Um, try to minimize the importance of church. You hear today that church is, you know, just something uh, uh, that, you know, the weak-minded or, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of things. Uh, we, we go out, perhaps you have friends, co-workers, maybe you have neighbors and you've invited them or, or to church uh, to an assembly. And we're going to deal with a lot of this today. But but you hear this thing, oh, oh I, I worship God, but I, I, I don't have to I don't have to go to church to do that I don't have to be in a organized formal setting to do that and I really want to um, discredit that I really my intent today is for us to leave here today realizing just how important quote unquote church is it, it, this building cinder blocks nice wood you know fancy lighting nice pews that's all a building. It, you know, sadly, but true, it's all going to burn one day. But the church won't. The church is, and we're going to look at all kinds of things today, you know, and, and probably maybe tonight even. But... The church, as we will see in just a few moments, is um, the body of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. And uh, I, I chose last year's theme. How many remember last year's theme? How many know, can just pull it out of your head, how many know what last year's theme was up there? Do you remember what the reference was even? <coughs> Colossians 1.18. So turn in your Bible to Colossians 1.18. We're going to use that as our verse to set the foundation for this morning. <coughs> Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Look down with me at verse 18. And he is the head of the body. What's the next two words? The church. The church. Who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And if we went back and looked at the context of this particular um, portion of Scripture in Colossians chapter 1, we'll find that the he spoken of is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the head of the body, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, um, verse number 4 says, Since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, Jesus and the love which ye have of all saints. Uh, if if uh, you look at the context, um, verse seven, as ye have learned of Epaphras, our fellow, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. Uh, and, and then in context, giving thanks unto verse twelve unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who have delivered us from the 
the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, spoken of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so all of this is, is um, laying the foundation for what is stated in verse number 18. And he, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence I, I really if, if I title it I, I really the title is simply church not an option and I, I want to encourage us here today so let's uh, pause and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us Father we come to you in the precious name of Jesus our Lord and Savior it is in Christ's name, it is in Jesus' name that we plead you here today that we ask, Father, that the Holy Spirit of God would use the Word of God, that you would help me, that you'd hide me behind the cross, but you would guide me, my thoughts, illustrations, Lord, your Word, that it would be fitly uh, joined together, uh, Lord, that we would see from your perspective, Lord, the importance of the local New Testament church. Father, we are thankful for the church universal. But God, you speak in, in, in so much more, uh, so much uh, majority of what you speak about when you talk about the church in your word, it is of the local New Testament church where we, your children, where we, your disciples, uh, can serve you for the furtherance of the kingdom. So have your will and way here this morning. Guide us, I pray, in Jesus' name and for his name's sake. Amen. So, honestly, this has been going on for, you know, decades and decades. But it really, for us here, it really came to a culmination, I think, in 2020. When COVID first came out, uh, there, there was a lot of uncertainty. And, and as, a, as a, a general precaution, um, we found that the government said, okay, you know, everybody stay home and uh, we're going to close close everything and and so they they closed churches all across the land now we were very fortunate we live in a you know rural community um, we we were not impacted near like some of the other um, churches were uh, brother Jack Treber out in California which that you know right there ought to tell you something um, I mean they 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 accrued I mean tens of thousands of dollars in fines um, and and uh, there there were those who uh, w you know ultimately went to jail uh, but this morning in Sunday school how many of you were in Sunday school just uh, probably about 80 90 percent of you were in Sunday school so it, my, and Mike didn't know this but um, the, the man that he mentioned this morning Stacy Shiflett um, he he posted this, and you you can find it not only on YouTube, but uh, if you if you're on Twitter or anything, you you can find this. Um, it it came out uh, this one September 10th uh, is is when this tweet went out. Uh, but he said he said this. Stacy Shiflet, um, if you're a Twitter guy, you can do at Pastor Shiflet S. H-I-F-L-E-T-T, -T, Pastor Shiflet. He said, our church voted unanimously tonight with secret ballot, now, you know, whatever, to add the following statement to our church bylaws and, I, and constitution. So here, here's, where, here's where I'm interpreting this. When he said with secret ballot, that's how... You know, in, in the tweet, he, he capitalized the word unanimous. Because if anybody wanted to cower, it's a secret ballot. 
Because you know, you're not held accountable. You can secretly be whatever you want to be. And nobody would know. Nobody would be the wiser. So I think that, from, from the context, uh, I, I think that's why he said that in this, in this text. Uh, so he said, or in this tweet. So he said, our church voted unanimously tonight with secret ballot to add the following statement to our church bylaws and constitution. I'm rejoicing in the joy of pastoring a unified group of Baptists. How rare is that? Here's the amendment. We strongly believe in the biblical command to worship God together in person. The word church means a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public place. An assembly. If there is no gathering together, there is no church. We are blessed to be able to share our church services via live stream with our elderly shut-ins and missionaries around the world. However, we do not believe that a live stream or recorded church service is a biblical replacement for the command to assemble together. Furthermore, we do not recognize nor will we comply with any outside edict, laws, mandate, restriction, or regulation by an ecclesiastical body or government entity interfering with our biblical and First Amendment constitutional right to assemble and worship. As a congregation, if forced to choose between the mandates of God or the mandates of man, we will choose to obey God. And then they have references, just like in our Constitution and bylaws, Hebrews 10, 25, right? Forsake not the assemblings of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but so much the more as you see the day approaching. Psalm 122, 1, Acts 5, 29. Acts 5, 29 is the statement made by Peter, we ought to obey God rather than man. 1 Corinthians 16, 2, Matthew 10, 28, 1 Timothy 3, 15, Acts 4, 31, Acts 11, 26. And, uh, and so uh, anyway, uh, it's just absolutely amazing. And we see more and more... Um, I'm just telling you, this is just, it's not, it's just amazing to me. I Literally, I got this in... Either Friday or Saturday's mail. I can't remember whether it was Friday or Saturday's mail. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know who it's from. Um, I'm not even sure. If, it, it, I think it's Kansas. 62005 zip code. 62005. I think Kansas. Anyway, very, very, I can't read the handwriting. And my handwriting is pretty bad. Um, and, and so the, the, the content, uh, there's a bunch of stuff, but the content, in a sense, is really statements about the church. He, he makes some statements. I, I'm not, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, pages and pages, and I'm not going to read that for the sake of time. But I just picked some things out that he made statements about the importance of church. He said, God gave me a commandment to be baptized into the church, 1 Corinthians 12 13 he said the church is the body of christ we just read that in colossians 1 18 right uh, if we are commanded to be baptized into the church that is a commandment that G jesus christ had to keep for me uh, and so he makes that statement uh, another statement he said uh, john will be the instrument that jesus will use to start his church so that jesus will have the means to probably baptize into a church by a proper authority the church we we cannot be baptized by a man walking around town baptizing people we are baptized by by a church into a church and of course uh, some of you have heard me make the comment um, easy things to do you know Jesus said in John 10 he said I am the door so if you want to go to heaven he said in John 14 6 I am the way the truth the life no man comes to the father but by me so if you want to go to heaven you got to go through the door and he said I'm the door so the door to heaven is Jesus Christ but the door into the local church is through baptism 
baptism. We are baptized into the local church by a local church. Um, he said this, uh, but this church was given the great commission, the ordinance of baptism, took communion, and was given the Bible. And, and he's talking about how at, at Pentecost, um, you can already see the, quote, church, even embryonic as it may be, they were already assembling, uh, they, they were already baptizing, and, and those kinds of things. Uh, he said, quote, the church is the institution that God, God has ordained for us to minister through. And so I, I, I mentioned that. You know, there is, and we'll talk about it, whether to, this morning or tonight, I think we'll get to it this morning. There is a universal church. In other words, there's people in China, in Russia, in Japan, in Africa, in Australia, in New Zealand, in you name it. Even, even in America there are saved people. Um, is this on? Um, that would have been good because you're you're supposed to be saved here today, right? Okay, just concerning me there for a minute. Uh, and and so we have a universal church. There there is a universal church, and the and the universal church is the bride of Christ. So you know when the rapture happens, Christians, quote unquote, followers of Christ, those who have been born again, as as Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter three. Uh, marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. So those born again believers all over the world, when the trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ shall rise and the we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to, uh, to be with them. Um, and, and so that's the idea there. So they're, they're, the universal church is the bride of Christ. But the universal church, you, you, you don't have a, a means, you don't have a method within the universal church to accomplish the will of God. And so within uh, within then Christendom, God established the local New Testament church. Um, Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, the church at first at Corinth, the, the church at Thessalonica, uh, Thessalonica the church at Colossae. Uh, he, he wrote to the region of Galatia, to the churches in the region of Galatia. Uh, he, we know Oh, he wrote letters to Thy the church at Thyatira. He wrote letters to the church at uh, Laodicea. There are many, there are many places, but they're all local New Testament churches. We call ourselves a local New Testament church. That's what we call ourselves. That's what we're founded uh, in in familiarity with. Um, he goes on. He says he ministered. He Christ ministered through the church. Uh, uh, let's see, three, oh, is it four over here? I don't have, okay. Uh, he makes a statement about, you know, not just any quote-unquote church. He has, a dis he has a discussion about so-called churches. But he said, we, we must choose that church which is the most doctrinally correct. We do not choose a church by location or friends or the music we like. <laughs> that's pretty impressive. Uh, that's pretty impressive. You don't see that much anymore. Um, and he says, keep in mind that the church is called the bride of Christ in the Bible. And then he just made a statement, uh, you know, which I highlighted because I can tell a lot about how somebody writes, whether they're a, a reformist, uh, whether they're, they're, they have correct dispensation, and, and he does. He says, I do not believe that Israel and the church are the same. I do believe that the church is different from Israel. We are in a different dispensation. And so I, I know based on those kinds of comments that at least... Uh, that part of his theology is correct. So uh, what I'm saying is I literally I just get this and, and I'm working on uh, the, the idea, the, this, the message about the church and, and we're seeing all of these 
events that 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 are uh, bringing our, their their way to us. Uh, I hear it all the time. And I'll bet you, I'm going to make this statement, and then I'm going to ask you a question. I heard I've heard this statement made. I can be a Christian and not attend church. How many of you have ever heard that statement made by somebody? You know. And please, I hope and pray that you've never been one to say that. Uh, but, but today, my goal is to dispel that notion, not from my opinion, but from Scripture. The only one that is promoting that thought, I can be a Christian and not attend church, is the devil. That is a satanic thinking. You will not, I repeat, you will not find that thought or that concept, or that principle in the scripture. In fact, quite the contrary. You will find the church a vital aspect uh, of, of the early um, Christian life. And so I, I, I really want you to think about this. I, I made this statement in here. In the early days of Christendom, Church was not a day in life, but rather a way of life. The, the early church came out of, if you will, was birthed out of Judaism. And we've talked about this before. The, 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 the Jewish faith, the Jewish religion, they lived it. They, they, they had certain days. They, they had certain beliefs. They, they didn't eat certain things. They did uh, do this. They, it was a way of life. And when Christ came not to dispel, not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law, he came and he brought to us a way of life, a, a further delineated, a further understood way of life, not just a day in life. It, it, uh, the Christian life ought not something we get up Sunday morning and put on. It ought to be something that we do seven days a week. We ought to be a Christian. We ought to be a follower of Christ. We are called, and, and we're not going to take the time uh, a lot to, to go all these different ways because we've done them in other messages, but we're called an ambassador. We're called, you know, disciples, followers of Christ. And so we have this mindset that that we we don't just, well, it's Sunday, so I'm gonna I'm gonna be a Christian today. Today. And and then, you know, Monday, phew, man, Sunday was rough. Now, you know, Monday through Saturday, I can live my life. I can do whatever I want. I, I can. Uh, and, and by the way, there, there are. Uh, um, there, there are those religious organizations that somewhat even promote that. You can live however you want, and then come Saturday night, you can go to you can go to confession. You can confess it all. You can you can you know say all your hail marys. You can uh, you know give whatever uh, whatever you're told to give for you know to be forgiven, um, and then. Got that taken care of. Now that's all behind me. And now I can go live my life however I want. Monday through, you know, Saturday afternoon. I can go back, uh, you know, to, to the confessional on, uh, on, on Saturday afternoon. I can go tell. Hey, how many are you glad you don't have to go to the confessional and tell me your life? <laughs> Man, I'm telling you. Two reasons. Two things there, right? A... I really don't want to hear it. And B, you really don't want to tell me. But uh, but anyway, uh, and so I'm just saying, all you know, all these different aspects. No, you you see, that's where Satan has um, done an incredibly good job at deception of, of this whole, and you hear me tell this all the time, this whole live your life, live your life, do your own thing, and just add a little bit of Jesus. 
Uh, no, that 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 is not that is not biblical, nor nor is it is it Christian. No, God gave us a new life. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? Same creature. The same uh, the old creature? No. What is he? He's a new creature. What what is what's supposed to happen? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And so the whole concept of the Christian life is that it is a life. It is a lifestyle. It is the way we now live our life in Christ. And so I, I really wanted to understand that. It was the, under, under Judaism. It was the it was their life. Um, that is why you you've, we've talked about this before. That is why excommunication was so fearful. Because for a Jew, if they were put out of the synagogue, it was horrible. Because they were alienated. They couldn't do business. In, in, the, in a Judeo life, in Judaism, I mean, you, your life, you, you were surrounded. You would go to the synagogue. You, you would um, meet. You would, you would do your uh, sacrifices. But everything was, was surrounding the life. Your 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 um, going shopping. Your I mean everything. It, it was all it was all a way of life. And when you were put out of, when you were excommunicated, uh, do you remember the story? You remember the story about the blind man, and he was healed. And he had been like thirty-eight years or something. And they said the the, 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 the uh, scribes and the Pharisees, when they heard about it, they they uh, they um, interviewed him, and and uh, they said, oh, "We're just not sure. We're going to go interview his parents." And if you remember the story, they interviewed his parents, and the, they his parents said, "Hey, he's of age. Ask him." And then I, I forget where it is in the Gospels. Uh, but but in that passage, in that passage about it, it there's a, a, just a quick little, I think, like one, one statement um, in that passage that said, um, this they said about, go ask him because he's of age. It said, this they said, for they feared the Jews that they would be put out of the synagogue. See, they were frightened because if you were put out of the synagogue, you, you were you were um, uh, you were alienated. You you couldn't do business. Your your way of life was um, temporarily, unless it was a permanent thing, it, it, it was ended. So uh, it was their life. It wasn't something that they just did once, once a week. So I want us to look at th this concept of the, the local New Testament church. Um, now, let me hasten to say, I'm not, I'm not saying you can't be saved if you don't attend church. But I'm saying a truly born-again believer will will want to attend church we we've been talking about this and this this kind of why it fell in right we have we've been talking about this last few weeks there's no middle of the road right there's either there's either lost saved you're a missionary mission field you're either born again or you're lost you're either saved or you're lost you know there's there's no middle of the road and so if someone is and remember we we looked at that matthew chapter 7 passage that talks about that, that broad is the way, wide is the gate, and where does it lead? To destruction. And, 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 then, and then, and it says, many, many go that way. And then it talks about straight and narrow is the way. And it talks about the leads to, to everlasting life. And then it says, how many go in there? Few. So in, in talking in talking about the local New Testament church, 
Once again, we're Baptists, unapologetic. I'm Baptist, B-A-P-T-I-S-T-S, as it's spelled. And one of the one of the uh, distinctions about being a Baptist is, believe it or not, sadly as it may be, the first S S one is saved membership. Saved membership. You think, well, that's kind of a no-brainer. You know what? Sadly, it's, it's not everywhere. We, we believe, as Baptists, we believe you ought to be, the, the only way you can be a part of the local New Testament church is if you're saved and baptized. Because the church is a called out assembly. The called out ones. Ecclesia. The called out ones. And we're called out from the world. And, and we're, we're called out from the world. 1 Corinthians, what is it? Uh, 6. No, 2 Corinthians, I maybe 6.17 or 1 Corinthians 6.17. Uh, Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. The, the whole idea in, in, in Ecclesia, in the Greek word uh, of the word church, is called out ones. We're called out from the world. We're called out, by, by the way. Abraham was called out. He said, God called Abraham out. He said, hey, I want you to leave the Ur, Ur of the Chaldees and I want you to come out. It's always a coming out and, and gathering together. So I, I, I use Colossians 1.18 because it speaks so distinctly and so certain of the aspect of the, the local church. And he, Christ, is the head of the body, the church. And we're going to look at different passages uh, about that. You know, we, we can look at the whole Ephesians 5. Husbands, Ephesians 5, 25. Ephesians, or Ephesians. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ loved what? The church. And gave himself for it. We have this incredible picture of Christ loving the church because the church is known as the bride of Christ. And so he's talking... As, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul is, is directed to write, and he's going, Hey, husbands, you love your wives as Christ, the head of the church, as Christ loves his bride, the local, the, 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 the church, which is the bride of Christ. So I want us to, to start with the simplicity. Number one, who started the church? Now, see, if the church was an institution created by man, by the way, we're going to talk about this a little bit too. If the church was an institution started by man, then, okay, then maybe, we, then maybe we could discuss the, the, um, re, the uh, legitimacy of, well, I don't have to attend church. Um, but since man did not <coughs> found or, or, or establish the institution of the family, God did. Man didn't establish the institution of government. God did. Man didn't establish or found the institution of the local church or the church. God did. And so since these are all institutions founded by God, there, there, there is an element then that we need to understand. Now turn with me if you would. We got the, uh, we, we might be back here to Colossians, um, but, but let's go look very quickly at Matthew chapter number 16. Matthew chapter number 16. Now, I, I understand this is Sunday morning, and uh, but regardless, it's church, and you know what? God has a whole lot more to say about it than I do, and so probably uh, there is going to be more scripture. We're, we're 
going to be in our Bibles more this morning and tonight, maybe than uh, than some messages. Um, but but we need to understand it is. More important what God says than what I say. Amen? Amen? Number one, who started the church? Matthew 16, are you there? Matthew 16? Yes. Look down with me at verse number 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He, Jesus, saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Man, Peter got it right, right off the bat that time. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build what? Whose church? Who's speaking? Jesus. It's Jesus' church. It's God's church. I will build my church, Jesus said, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He said, I will build my church. That's why I keep, I, I keep telling, it, it, it pretty much, I, I don't know uh, the last time I've said it. I, I know that I've uh, communicated it to the Sholabos. I know I've communicated it to the Squires. I know I've communicated it to the Seastings. Those are the, some of the newer families. Um, but when people visit, and then we go back and visit them, I'll talk and I'll say, hey, we're praying for you. We're praying that God... God will lead you where he wants. I said, we certainly would love to have you here at Olive Branch, but this is God's church. And God is the builder of this church. He, he, and, and so we believe from a local New Testament church that God is the builder. And so we want to do our part. We want to be friendly. We want to be welcoming. We, we, we want to be loving. But most importantly, we want to be biblical. And so we, we want to seek the Lord. We ought to be praying, Lord, bring those who you want here at Olive Branch Baptist Church, at this local New Testament church, because you are the builder. This is your church, God. And so we want, we want God to be the one to lead people. Certainly, we ought to be out handing out tracts. Certainly, we ought to be out knocking doors. Certainly, we ought to be in, in, inviting our coworkers and our friends and our neighbors and our family. Certainly, we ought to be doing those things. Because God expects us to serve Him within the local New Testament church organization. But it's God's church. He is the builder of this church. And so he tells Peter that th uh, upon this rock, and, and by the way, this rock speaks not of Peter, but upon the statement that Peter had just made about thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. That's what he's going to build the church upon. That's the gospel message. The church is built upon the gospel message. The death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ, of Jesus being the Christ. And he says, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So let's ask ourselves the question. If the Lord Jesus Christ started the church, don't you think that it would be very important to him? Since he started the church and he's going to build it. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be important to him? He, why would he start something and then say, oh, you know, it's, I just kind of started it, but, you know, I'm really not interested. It's not, yeah, just, you know, it, it, it was a good idea. I, you know, I thought it might work, but, you know, forget it. it it's, just, it's, just not, it's just not working out well. Do you see that happening by God? No, no, we don't see that. 
If Jesus thought it was important for him to come to this earth and die for us, to take upon himself our sins, and then to provide us with the opportunity to be saved by simply receiving a free gift of salvation, the finished work of Christ upon the cross in our stead, don't you think that that is important to him? If Jesus went to all of that effort, if he went to all the pain, all the shame, all that he did to provide us with the free gift of salvation, think with me now, think logically. You know, we're, we're one of those places that we don't want you to check your brain at the door. We want you to bring your brain in. We want you to be actively involved in worship. You ought to be coming to church actively participating in listening and actively participating in, in, in the Word of God and allowing the Holy Spirit of God to speak to your heart. Think with me. He didn't stop there. He provided us with our very own support group. He knew that once we were saved... That's when the battle begins. Before we're saved, we already are, are in a sense, uh, serving Satan. Because remember, no middle of the road. You're either serving the Lord or you're serving Satan. There is no in-between. There, there is no other option. <clears throat> God knew that once someone was saved, they, we would need a support group. We, so he established the church, the means or the method by which Christ, Christians, excuse me, come together with a common cause or a common goal to worship our Savior Jesus Christ. We have, and, and I don't have it, but most of you, hopefully all of you, have at some point, I know collectively when we established our Constitution and bylaws, we, we read it, and maybe maybe I'll do that tonight. Uh, maybe I'll break out our, our covenant. How many remember that we, we read and, and agreed to publicly when we, when we voted on our our current constitution and bylaws and then everyone since then who has read our constitution and bylaws and stood up here and publicly said that they've read and agreed to them in that constitution and bylaws is a church covenant where where we as a as a uh, as an organized group of fellow believers of called out ones have agreed to pray for one another uh, to love one another, to give of our time, talent, and treasures. And, and, and so I think I might do that. I might try to break that out and, and, and read that to us. <clears throat> but, but we have come together with a common cause uh, or a common goal, and that is to worship our Savior. So number one, man didn't start the church. <clears throat> God did. And as a result, um, we need to understand that because he started it, it's important. Number two, I told you we'd, we'd get to this probably. Number two, what does the word church mean? If Jesus started this thing called the church, what does then the word church mean? Now, we, we have it translated into English. We, we don't, most of us here, uh, don't, we don't speak Hebrew. Uh, we don't speak Greek. Many of us don't speak English really well. But anyway, uh, but... but, but it's been translated for us out of Hebrew or out of Greek because the word church was, <clears throat> excuse me, the word church, um, there was the concept, the idea of, of the church in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, but specifically in the New Testament where the, the word is predominantly found and used, the, the word church simply means 
the called out ones or, or a calling out or an assembly. It is a feminine noun. It's the term of the word uh, um, ecclesia. And, and the word ecclesia is simply called out assembly. We're called out from the world and we're called to come together. It's an, an assembled group. So now if, if ecclesia is a called out group, if it's the called out ones called to assemble, then how can someone say... <coughs> That they don't have to assemble when the whole idea of the church for the Christian is to assemble. You see what I'm saying? And, and so that's what I, I really want us to understand. A called out assembly of believers or followers of Jesus Christ. So that's why in, in the acrostic, B-A-P-T-I-S-T-S, -S, the, the first S1 is saved, baptized members. So we believe that... The, for, for, for you to say that you are a member of a local New Testament church, there, there's some criteria. Number one, you got to be saved. You got to be saved. <clears throat> Number two, as we mentioned, and even in, in this, this guy's letter, even as he mentioned, <clears throat> The entrance into the local New Testament church is via baptism. Baptism. <laughs> And so you're baptized, you're, 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 you're standing up here publicly, and you're saying to a group of already previously have been saved and previously have been baptized scripturally by immersion, and they publicly stand up and they say, hey, I want you to know I too am a follower of Jesus. And I, too, want to publicly identify with his death, burial, and resurrection. And an ordinance, a command given by God to a local group of assembled people, have been given the authority and the command... To do baptism. And so we baptize someone who has now made a profession of faith in Christ, who is now born again, and who is publicly identifying in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and who are now dead to sin, dead to self, and arise uh, to walk, uh, resurrected to walk in newness of life. And it's all founded under the uh, auspice uh, of the authority of the, the, the New Testament church. Pretty much everybody could go <clears throat> to, and you're right there. You don't have to go very far. Look over if you, you know it's familiar to you, but still look over Matthew 28. <clears throat> Matthew 28. We call this the Great Commission. So we have been commissioned. We have been commissioned simply means commanded. So we have been commissioned. We have been commanded by God. He said, verse 18, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All powers given unto me in heaven and in our earth. Go ye. Go ye. Therefore, and teach all nations. Now, that first teach all nations is the idea of to, to, to make disciples. It is very different than the next word teaching in verse 20. They're not the same. It's not the same Greek word. The first teach is to make disciples. To go tell people the good news. 
to teach all nations. To teach them what? To, to teach them about their need of a Savior, that, that they're in their lost condition, and that they need um, a Savior to save them from their sin. Because our sin has a wage. Our sin, our sin has a penalty. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. And so we need to tell people, we need to teach all nations, we need to instruct everyone that we're all sinners. And as a result of being a sinner, we have a wage, we have a declaration, a judicial declaration from God that we are on our way to the lake of fire for all eternity. But that we don't have to go there because Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, left the heaven uh, the, the, and there's a splendor and majesty came to this earth lived a perfect sinless life went to the cross became sin who knew no sin became sin for us became sin and paid the penalty for when he said it is finished he said the job's done the father had already declared uh, 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 or turned his back on Jesus and judicially declared him sin in our stead and and so when we when we come to that place we teach all nations. Then what do we do? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. That's making them part of a local New Testament church. And then what do we do? Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Uh, we we have um, uh, adopted Ephesians. I'll get there. We've a, kind of adopted Ephesians chapter four. And we use it in our literature as our mission statement, if you will. Ephesians chapter four, uh, in verse number twelve. <laughs> In verse number 11 says, And he, God, gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of the Christ. So, for the perfecting of the saints. We've talked about this before. That's this whole teaching them to observe all things. That's what we're doing. We're, we're, we're in our Bibles. We're learning our Bibles. We're studying to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're here being educated. We're being here trained to uh, for the perfecting of the saints. Uh, what? Uh, for the maturing of the saints. So that we can be taught to observe the things that God has commanded us to do. Why? For the work of the ministry. So we can go out there and tell people about Jesus. So we can do the Great Commission. So we can go into all the world and teach all nations. And then when we do that... And we see people get saved and, and then we see people added to the church. What happens? Back in Ephesians 4.12, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The word edifying, it means to build up. The church is built up. So here we see again, it's an assembly. It's, it's not one person. Uh, you, you would think um, th this idea, the, the word church as a feminine noun, it, doesn't that make sense since the church is, by the way, feminine noun, the church is the what of Christ? The bride of Christ. See, even, even in the word, it's feminine. Why? Because we are the bride of Christ. You would expect the bride to be a woman, 
a feminine. So it's a feminine noun. It makes sense it would be feminine. So here we see again that an assembly is not one person, but it's a group. Of group of who? Of like-minded people. A, a, a group of people who have trusted Jesus and then said, I, I need to unite with others who believe like I believe, who, who believe the Bible, who, who believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus uh, um, came to this earth and became sin for us, uh, that, that, that the, the, the Bible is the very Word of God without error. With, with, uh, and, and we can just go on and on and on and on and on. And so that's why we have a covenant as a, as a church. that We have covenanted. That's not an easy word to say. We have covenanted it together. We, we have made a pact. Uh, we, we have agreed to come together. Sunday school, 930. Morning, 1030. Sunday night, 6 o'clock. Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. We've agreed mutually th through an organizational pact. P-A-C-T, pact is in. We, 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 we've made a covenant together. We made a pact with one another. And we are going to worship the Savior. Um, turn, turn with me to Acts chapter... Man, I'm running out of time. Turn to Acts chapter... Well, I think we'll be able to finish this point. And then, then we'll, we'll come back and look at some more. Go to Acts chapter 7. This might work out well. <clears throat> While you're turning there, let me give you the, uh, uh, the, the, the basis here. Acts chapter 7... And this is the story of the stoning of Stephen. And uh, if, if in doubt, uh, you, you can um, look. Um, and wait, where am I? Um, Acts chapter 7. Uh, and then said the high priest, are these uh, things so? And he said men brethren and fathers all right so he and we're going we're going to find in verse 8 of chapter 6 and Stephen full of faith and power did great wonders and miracles among the people he and so there's a conversation going on so they ask him and he Stephen said men brethren fathers hearken the God of glory appeared unto our fathers Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia which he dwelt in uh, Charon and he said unto them get thee out or this is the calling of Abraham right out of the Earl Chaldees and, and, and form thy kindred and come into the land which I shall show thee and so so Stephen begins to rehearse Jewish history from Abraham being called out by God to leave his home, land through Jacob going down into Egypt to see Joseph and staying there for many, many years, 430 years. And then Moses being used by God to deliver the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt. And, and, and it's here in the discourse that we find the word church used. Look with me at verse 37. Verse 37. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church. In the wilderness, which the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them and in their hearts turned back unto Egypt. Okay, so 
It was he that was in the church in the wilderness. What do we know about the, 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 the wilderness? It was the called out. It was the children of Israel. And they were called out from Egypt. They were called out from the world. And God said, hey, I'm going to bring you out and I'm going to give you your own land over there in Canaan. So we have that whole idea. And so... Stephen is just preaching up a storm and he and he call and, and he uses the word church the called out from other nations establishing a specific group of people the children of Israel to differentiate them from other nations we see it referencing a group of people a common group their commonality was in this case their heritage they were Jews. Uh, how many of you have heard? The, I, I'm going to use the first part of this. You finish it for me. I, I, I'm certain you know this. No man is. Well, you keep going. Do you know the rest? Island unto himself. Island unto himself. You, you're absolutely correct. No man is an island unto himself. Within the church, God knows that we need each other. So this thing called the church, Jesus started it. This thing called the church, by its very definition, is a group of called out ones called out to assemble together you can't do that on the golf course you can't do that in the fishing boat you can't do that in bed on Sunday morning you can't do that in any other way than to gather together in a designated place we call the church building and I know okay I know two things I'm over on time but I also know we mistakenly reference often the building as the church well I'm going to church well, that is sort of correct because I'm going to assemble together with other believers in a designated place. So when we say I'm going to church, we can, we can get away with that because we're a call out individual called to assemble together with other individuals in a specific place. For a specific purpose, and that's to worship. So when we say I'm going to church, we could do that. Church, not an option, was started by God, started by Jesus Himself, the second person of the Trinity. It's important because God instituted it. And by its very word, church, it's called out assembly call out specifically to gather together for a common purpose to worship God I hope as we continue this and there's a couple of more points that we're going to make tonight as we continue to peel this onion back of the importance of you and I gathering together called out by God to meet here together for the purpose of worship and some other things that we'll learn about as we go. Let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this institution we call that you call the church. Thank you for calling us out of the world. Thank you, Father, for calling us to assemble together with other like-minded believers to gather to a specific place at a specific time for a specific purpose. And that purpose being to worship you, to praise you, to lift your name in adoration and exaltation, to sing praises.
Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you, Lord. I believe I speak for all here. Thank you, Lord, for saving us and calling us out and giving us one another to worship together, to praise you together, to be encouraged by one another. Use this invitation, Father, as you see fit. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do here in our midst. We pray in Jesus' name and for his name's sake. Amen. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Let's all stand together. I, I don't know how the, I, I know this is more teaching than anything. I don't know. Maybe the Lord led you in some specific way with our heads bowed and our eyes closed uh, as we're standing here together. Maybe, maybe you need to come to an altar and just say, thank you, Lord. Maybe you need to come to an altar and confess and say, Lord, forgive me for I have not held the church in esteem like I should. Father, forgive me forsaking the assembling. Father, I see in your word you started the church. I see in your word that we are the bride of Christ who you gave yourself for. Father, would you give me a fresh sense of the importance of this institution you established called the church. I gather together with other brothers and sisters in Christ at a specific time a specific location for a specific purpose to worship to learn how to serve you more a place to serve the local New Testament church. Hey Amen. Well, I hope, again, I hope you'll come back tonight. There's nothing more important than, listen, I'm, I'm just, I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but listen, you read the same covenant that I read. You agreed to the same covenant I agreed, and we agreed to meet together. And, and I understand that you might have to be gone. I know like I know the show of those. They're not going to be here. They gotta, they're going to be up in, in the Chicago area. Okay, I get it if you can't. But sometimes, just because it's not convenient, sometimes just because you're tired, oh, look, I bet you ask around, there's some other people that are tired. But they're still here. We need each other. Amen. And, and so I encourage you to be back tonight. We're going to look at a few more points along this journey of, of this thing called the church. Amen. So 5 o'clock, and if you can make it back, we'll have a time of prayer. Men uh, up here in the sanctuary, ladies uh, down, down in, um, in the middle classroom. Then our 6 o'clock service uh, will meet together as well.